So our next speaker is a friend of Silbert. Well, sorry for messing up with the name. And he's going to present uh, types as first class values in the foreign language. Please go ahead. OK, thank you, Ningying. Um, yeah, I'm Fritjof Siebert. I'm actually from uh, Tokiva Software, GmbH, a small company where I'm in the small team. We're working on the fusion language. Um, I will give a much more applied talk than what we've heard before. I hope you're fine uh, with that. And I'm actually not a functional guy. I have a very strong object-oriented Java background. So please accept that my vocabulary is maybe sometimes a bit Java colored or uh, I still learn a lot in this community, and that's why I'm actually here. <coughs> so, uh, I have four, t four parts in my talk. Uh, I assume none of you know about the fusion language, so I'll start with a quick intro into the motivation and, and basic concepts of the language. And then I focus on different aspects related to types, how types are used as values. Uh, I'll introduce something I call type features, and in the end, I want to show how types are used to distinguish to reference effects. Uh, the motivation of the fusion language is <coughs> to have a very simple language, basically uh, bring different aspects, different concepts down to one concept which we call a feature. And instead of having the developer make decisions how something is implemented, uh, we want to have tools make these decisions for you. And a third point, we see that more and more systems are safety critical, so we want to have a language, a high-level language, that is usable in the safety critical domain. Um, Fusion is statically typed. It has algebraic types. It has parametric types. It supports inheritance and redefinition. It has dynamic binding, and it is a pure language using effects to encapsulate side effects. I'll give some examples, go into details here. Here's an example how a product type is defined in, fu in Fusion. You define a feature, in this case the feature point, that also defines a product type. The feature point is a constructor that constructs with two arguments, x and y, a product of two float values. A second kind of feature is a function. Here, d squared is a function that takes two arguments, x and y, and computes a result, in this case, the distance to the origin of the point x, y. Next, features can be nested, so we can move the d square uh, into the feature point, so it becomes an inner feature of point and has access to the fields x and y in that point. Um, <coughs> Fusion has immutable fields, so instead of declaring a function, we can also make d square a field which semantically has no effect as long as uh, side effects. Uh, no side effects occur, occur. The only difference that this has is uh, that it forces the calculation of the value at the point. The point is at the point in time where the point is created, while the previous function version calculates the value at the point that d square is called. Um, d square is not the only field in this example. The oops. The x and y argument fields are also fields that are implicitly initialized when uh, the point is created. So I go back uh, to the function version. Uh, what you can do with features to actually uh, execute code is you can perform feature calls. And I give a small example here. You can call a point, you can call this constructor to actually create a value for a point here with the coordinates three and four, and you can call d square on that point, pass the result to another feature, say, uh, which when we run this then prints the result. So fairly simple. Uh, Fusion supports different kinds of polyform, for, uh, polymorphism. It has some types, it has parametric types, 
and it supports dynamic binding. I will quickly explain that. Uh, going back to our point, I add a, ne <coughs> a next a second product type, which is a line, and I can now define an object, which is a choice of either a point or a line. So we have a sum type, a tagged union type uh, object here that could be either a point or a line. And we can now define a feature to draw an object and match on the object parameter uh, to distinguish whether it's a point in line and then draw that. And we can call this draw object with <coughs> an instance of a point or an instance of a line. And what actually happens is on the call is the instance gets wrapped into a tagged union type. So the point in this example gets equipped with a tag, a type identifier, such that the match in the draw can decide that this is actually a point that wants to be drawn, and correspondingly in the case of a line. The second type of, type of polymorphism is via type parameters. And in this case, we can, we well, first, uh, uh, what I need is something called abstract features. So we can define a feature object with an inner feature draw that is declared abstract. If we do something like that, it's very similar to defining an interface in Java or a type class in Haskell. And now <coughs> we have inheritance, so we can make point inherit from object and provide an implementation for draw and also line can also inherit from object and provide a different implementation for draw. And now uh, we can have draw object receiving an object with a type parameter t that has to inherit from object and call draw on that. And very similar to the previous example, we can now call draw object with either a point or a line. But what happens here at runtime is slightly different. In this case, the point or line gets not wrapped into some tag uh, type, but we have monomorphization. That means we get different versions of draw object for points and lines that are used at runtime. Next, dynamic binding is also supported. And for that, we need reference type. So we can change our object to be a reference type, which for the parametric type example has no semantic effect at all. The code stays the same. But this now allows us to do something else with that because reference types can be assigned to from any type that inherits from that. So we can do something like we can define a sequence of objects that contains a mixture of points and lines and we can iterate that sequence and call draw on these. And what happens now is when we assign these points or lines to uh, that sequence, they get box, box they can get, get wrapped into usually heap allocated uh, objects that are equipped with type information similar to uh, the tagged union types. And this type information is then used on a call to decide which versions which version of the draw function should be called. So that much to my quick intro on uh, the fusion language. Next, I want to use how types are used within fusion features as values. Coming back to the example with parametric types before that I've shown where an object O of type T that inherits from object is called, what I've shown you is actually just a syntactic sugar of the explicit version. Draw object actually has two arguments. It has a T, which is a type uh, that must be object or any subclass of that, and a value argument that is exactly of that type. So each feature that can be called uh, can have a set of type arguments and a set of value arguments. And the type arguments always, by convention, always come first before the value arguments. But syntactically, they are kept as close as, as possible to the value arguments. Um, features that define types 
infusion are either constructor features that define product types or choice features that uh, define some types. And all these types may also have type parameters. So we could have a version of point that is not fixed to floating point values, but that has an arbitrary numeric type for the coordinate, coordinates or also our object could have an uh, numeric type parameter and then pass it on to the different variants of that choice. <coughs> when features are called, um, we provide the type parameters and the value parameters. As an example, I have a pair here. It's a pair of two values of the same type T. And so it has three arguments, the type and the two value arguments for the actual values. And we create three pairs here, one with two integers, one with two strings. And the third one, which is a pair of type option F64, which is a maybe float value. And the first one is nil and the second is almost pi. And all these calls use all three arguments. Fusion uses a lot of type inference, so in most cases, the type parameters could be omitted. In this example, the, uh, in the first two cases, the i32 or the string can be inferred from the actual arguments. The third example, values nil and almost pi, um, are unrelated, so they're, they're in the third example, uh, that the actual type that is desired is an option cannot be inferred by the compiler, so there we need to explicitly mention the type. <coughs> in contrast, if we use a type as uh, a feature as a type, like here in a function add uh, with an argument p, which is a pair of two 32-bit uh, integers, uh, we have to provide all the type parameters so here we have pair with i32. So if a feature is used as a type, uh, the value arguments are left out and the type parameters are actually pre presented, are given. So this much to how it within calls, types and value arguments are treated in a very similar way but to make this really powerful, I want to now show uh, how type features can be used in Fusion. I want, as an example, I want to define a feature, a function feature, that sums up all the values in a list, and all these values must be numeric values that we can actually have a, a defined sum. The problem is we can easily, we can add the head of the list plus recursively the sum of the tail. But the question is, what do we do with an empty list? Where do we get the values that corresponds to zero for an arbitrary numeric type? And the solution in, in Fusion is uh, that the feature numeric defines what we call type features for 0 and 1 that provide a value of the underlying type. And they are declared abstract because in numeric we don't know what the 0 value is right now. And concrete numeric implementations like I32 then provide implementations for 0 and 1 uh, that in this case just returns the 0 or 1 constants. And with this, in our implementation of sum of, we can use t.0 to get the value of 0 in the actual numeric type that was given to this feature. And these kind of type features are, lot, are used a lot within the standard library of, of Fusion. For example, numeric defines monoids, sum, and product for all numeric values that are based on the 0 and 1 implementation and that use as an operation the plus and, and times operation as defined for the actual numeric type. And 
there's actually there's an uh, inheritance structure of the type features that is parallel to the inheritance structure of the underlying feature. So numeric defines <coughs> abstract features like plus or minus that are implemented by complete concrete implementation and the corresponding type defines things like zero, one, sum and product that are implemented by the concrete type features. So that much to type features. And now <coughs> I want to come to how types are used in fusion to name, to refer to effects. I haven't talked about effects yet, so I have to first say what, how you, uh, fusion uses algebraic effects. Um, as an example, I present a hello world here, which, um, which uh, uses the io.out effect and the syntax we use for that is we use the IO out as it is installed in the current environment. So we need to be called with, with an environment where this effect, we could also say capability, is present that we can print something to IO out. Then we call this hello world to actually run the code. Um, when this is part of a library function, we have to document that this actually has the side effect, and we do this with an exclamation mark, and the type of the effect that this code uses. And now if we run this, we of course see the output because IO out print line prints this to standard out. We can now analyze also our application, and the static analysis determines that this application requires the IO out effect. There's so one thing special about IO out is IO out has a default uh, handler that is installed if there's nothing done explicitly. So that's why we don't have to do anything special here. But what we could do is we could run this with a user defined handler as well, which is what I want to show you now. So we could define our own handler. Don't look at the details here, but what is important is in our own handler, in our own handler, we use io.error to uh, print something and we mangle around with the string a bit. And now we can create a new instance of the IO out uh, effect. So we call, in this case, the IO out effect providing our implementation uh, of the handler. And now we need to install this to run our code. So we call use on this, which inst installs that implementation of, of the IO out effect and receives a Lambda expression that then executes the code. And if we run this, we see our mangled output. What we don't see here is that this is actually not to standard out, but to standard error. Uh, and if we analyze the effects on this, we see that actually the whole program no longer depends on IO out, but now it depends on IO error because our handler diverts the output to standard error. Okay, so the last example, which is a bit lengthier, but I hope I can more or less finish in time, uh, is I said that fields in, in fusion are immutable, but there's a mutate effect that allows us to create mutable uh, variables. So we use this here in a feature that counts the number of elements in a sequence by creating a mutable field, goes through all the elements, increments that mutable field, and returns the result of this counting. And mutate is the type of this effect, so we need to use that type to access that from the environment, and we also need to document that this function requires the mutate effect. Now to run this, we need to use the mutate effect, and in there we can now use our count, for example, to count the number of 
even values in between 1 and 10, <coughs> and it prints 5. Now, it's a bit unfortunate if we want to use a mutable variable locally uh, that now our whole program becomes uh, dependent on the mutate effect. So we would like to encapsulate uh, the fact that this routine performs mutat mutation somehow. And the way we can do that is we can declare locally a type, I call this MM here, which inherits from mutate. Else it doesn't do anything, doesn't add anything, it's just uh, uh, our own version of mutate that we want to use within this function. And now we install this own version and run our code in there and we use our version of mutate to create a mutable variable and once we do that we no longer depend on the mutate effect because everything that happens here happens locally so we have documented that the whole mutation is local to our code so we can call this count without exposing that there's any mutation of the overall system. But we can go further. We could e uh, even uh, make this count, uh, uh, give this count a type parameter, such that the caller can say what is the mutation environment that we are working with. So I call this M, which is a type argument which must inherit from mutate. And now we can use the M here to create, to create our mutable variable. We don't need the code to create the local uh, mutate effect anymore. And uh, but what we need is we need to declare now that our count function depends on uh, the M effect being installed. And we can even now return the mutable value directly because the caller no provides the M and knows what it uh, does. So, coming uh, towards the end. Now, going even one step further, we might want to have the caller provide the mutable variable so we could even make this a parameter to our our count. We no longer need to create this in here. So we can now, as a caller, use, create our own instance of mutate and pass a mutable variable to our count to be used in that code. That's it. I'm basically through. Ning Ning is getting nervous. <laughs> uh, so to my conclusion, fusion the language aims at unifying uh, concepts, and I think I could show you that types play an integral part uh, in, 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 in that. One point is that parametric types and value arguments are treated very similarly in function, and types are used to name to distinguish effects. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the very nice introduction to this uh, future language. Maybe I will start by like asking a question myself. Um, so you introduced like all the features supported by this language, but I seem to be like missing the like high level picture of this language. Like, what are you using this language for? Um, um, maybe maybe a bit bit of background before I started working on this. I, I worked for another company where we did an uh, implementation of Java for safety critical applications. Um, so we saw the need that in safety critical applications that people want to use higher level languages. Uh, but in retrospect, Java is not the most suitable language for that area. So the idea is to, to, to define a simple language for that domain. Um, but I don't have any users at the moment. It's still in a very early prototypical state, so still a lot of do. And I, 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 there's a lot of features of that language that I have not men mentioned here that are relevant for safety critical applications. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, we can take one question from the audience. 
Right. So, so you mentioned uh, type inference, uh, but there are a lot of things going on here. So, what what do you ex what do you, uh, what properties do you get from type inference? You have principal types, uh, or is it best effort, or what? Yeah. Do, um, is it, do you have a decibel procedure that always works, or do you sometimes have to put uh, annotations manually? There, there's some cases where you have to put the types explicitly, like in the example where from nil and string you cannot infer that you want to have an, uh, an option of string, uh, these, 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 these kinds of things. Uh, but where it's straightforward, that, that we're basically from arguments passed to a call, you can if infer these types, they are inferred automatically. Okay. No. okay. So okay. it's kind, kind of best effort, but it's in clear, clearly defined cases where the type inference works and where, where it doesn't. All right, all right. No. Thanks. Yeah, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.